our programs to the community, the Thousands of Eden each year, each summer, throughout the year, other projects, but right now we're talking about this project, so whether I could help and sponsor a year and have a great chalak in the schus of Abotzus Ter de Rabim, call Irgen Shir Ter at 718-851-8651 or email tapecenter at yeshivanet.com. I'd like to give a big shakar to Rabbi Goldbaum for sponsoring tonight's shir. We'd like to give a big shakar to Elam Shane for sponsoring tonight's shir. As a schus for two shiduchim, zivugim agunim bekorov. We'd also like to give a shakar, sponsor of tonight's shir, Lili Neshamay, Sarav Chaim Yitzchak ben Rabbi Zviel Zchayin Avracha, Rabbi Shalom Asnomi, Bas Rabbi Dali Arye, Rabbi Shalom and Rabbi Shalom, Bas Rabbi Aaron Yosef Ala Shalom. Tanish B'Sayim Tzuris B'Tzara Chaim. Tonight we have the cover to have with us once again, the noted darshan, Rabbi Sacha French, Lita Roshivas Nei Yisrael, Baltimore, to speak on the topic of no pain, no gain in dealing with adversity. It's my cover to call on Rabbi French for tonight's Russia. Just Rabbi Rabbi Deitz, Rabbi Bald, Run of Rabban and Rabbi Sai. As always, I want to give a special shakach to to Rabbi Bald, who is a very difficult man to say no to. And uh, as much as I try, but he doesn't let me say no. So I want to thank him and thank all the Marganim and all the sponsors for the Drusha. It's a it's a tremendous chizuk to come into base Medrash in the summer and to see a, a Zal Oilam that is being mitzapeh for the Vetera. It's reminiscent of the Chazal that the fish live in water their whole time, but yet when, the, when it rains, they lift up to get another drop of water. And uh, you're surrounded, Arum Gevichelt with Teira here in, in Flatbush, but nevertheless, you come out to hear Noch 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 Advar Teira. <clears throat> I want to speak about tonight an important lesson that you learn from the story of <clears throat> Mechiras Yosef. Now you're probably thinking, oh, Mechiras Yosef, he's going to talk about Sinas Chinam and Sinas Achim, which would be appropriate because we are on the threshold of the three weeks. But that is not what I want to talk about. Nothing to do with Mechiris Yosef per se, or Sinas Achim, or Sinas Chinam. But that last parsha of the story of Yosef and his brothers, when Yosef finally admits to his brothers, Ani Yosef, Haida Vichai, I always found as one of the most dramatic parshas in the Torah climactic ending of the story that goes on for three weeks. Vayeshev Miketz, Vayikash. Here the brothers thought that they were being tormented by a cruel despot and had no idea in truth that this was Yosef, their long lost brother. And when he finally admitted that he indeed was Yosef, Vayemer Yosef Elecho Vani Yosef Hayoyed Vichoy they couldn't answer. They were speechless. Zokrashi, why? Zokrashi, poshet, nivhalu miponav, mipnei habusha. They were embarrassed. They were humiliated. And wouldn't you be? Try putting yourself in their places. They had thought all these years that they were right and Yosef was wrong. In their mind, Yosef was an evil person, always trying to get them. And he had to be stopped at all costs, they thought. He was a right if he could be thrown, he could be, he could be killed. And now they see that they were dead wrong. And when a person in life comes to realization all these years later, you were wrong for all these years. It's a humiliating and humbling experience. 
And rather than this evil person that they thought Yosef was, he had saved them. Not only had saved them, but he had saved the entire world. And we can feel, feel, fully appreciate how Rashi learns the next posuk. Vayemer Yosef elachov geshuno elai vayigoshu. Yosef tells him, "Kum nenter, come close." Zokt Rashi, farvos ra oisam nisaykim lachareim. They were they were walking back. They were the expression. They were taken aback. Omar. They were embarrassed. He called, he comforted them. He wanted to appease them. He wanted to mollify them. He wanted to make them more at ease. Because he saw how humiliated and how embarrassed they were. They couldn't look at him. He saw their discomfort and somehow wanted to put them at ease. But the second part of that posik, Geshu noy elai vayigoshu, which Rashi tells us are words of tanchumen and words of comfort and words of brotherhood and love. But the next words in that posik, Asher mecharte moisi mimitzraima, you brothers, you guys, who sold me to, to, down to Mitzrayim, which in effect means, you guys sold me down the river. You remember that? I remember how you went ahead and threw me in the pit? So what is it? Is it the race of the Pusik? That he's trying to be Menachem them and trying to comfort them? Or is it he's trying to go ahead and make them feel fakert? It's like he's turning the knife. You remember that? Remember how you went there and sold me down the river? So which is it? Is it the Reisha? Diri Tanchumen? Or Asher Mecharte Meisiheina? You're a bunch of Rishoyim. You sold your own brother down the river. And if you're embarrassed, you should be embarrassed. But obviously that's not what those words mean. Because Rashi tells us that he was trying to go ahead and be Menachemim. So what is it? What do those words Hashem Mecharte Meisiheina mean? Zokter Heiliges Fasemes. A unique insight into what this Pesach means. Totally different than Pshut Shomikra. When Yosef goes ahead and makes his announcement, Ani Yosef, Besides being humiliated and embarrassed, the brothers had a profound feeling of guilt for the fact that they sold Yosef. Because they realized what a tzaddik yisoid oilam Yosef was. And that's in fact what the Pasik says, Kini Mahnumi Panov. They looked at his panim and they saw the panim of a tzaddik yisoid oilam. And they're thinking to themselves, in Mitzrayim, the cesspool of Mitzrayim, he was able to maintain his madrega and to become a tzaddik. Vas volt geven if he would have stayed by Yaakov Avinu at his house. We did a terrible avla to him, besides everything else. But we diminished him. If this is what he became when he was in Mitzrayim, what would have been? If he would have always remained in Eretz Yisrael with Yankiv Avinu and the support of the brothers and to be by the Tzaddik Yaakov. And that is what's bothering them, besides everything else. But look at an Avlo we did to the Velt, to him. We deprived Yosef of, of Aliyah that he could have had. We're going to have to give Din the Cheshben for that. And it's to that very point that Yosef was responding. And he's saying, You know what Yosef was saying? You did me the grass to Teva. 
he sold me to Mitzrayim. Because I became who I became by virtue of the fact that I had to deal with the adversity that Mitzrayim threw at me. And not had I been in the comfort of the house of Yankov Avinu, I wouldn't have to work, I wouldn't have to steig, I wouldn't have to fight, and it would have never been a Yosef. You did me a toiva, Zoktis Vasemes. A gewaldige toiva, because I am who I am, by virtue of the fact that I had to fight. And I owe you Yashakayach. In fact, the Svasemis makes a play on words. Asher machartem oisi heima, heina. Asher machartem. So just like Chazal Darshan, Asher shibarto. Asher yasher koichach asher shibarto. Zok the Svasemis, yasher koichach that you sold me to Mitzrayim. You don't have to apologize. You don't have to be embarrassed. Because had I been there in the safe environment of Yankov Avinu, who knows? Who knows what I would have become? Asher mechartem. Yasher koichach asher mechartem. Azeisok desvasemes. He's not trying to twist the knife in their sides. He's thanking them, thanking them for putting him in this matzav, because by virtue of the adversity that he had to face, that's why he became a Yosef Atzadik. And herein lies one of the great lessons of life. And that is people grow by challenges and even by adversity. And if one can survive those challenges, he will be in a better place by virtue of the fact that he had the shverkite and he had the adversity and he had the pain. That's why he became who he became. You know, Dr. Abraham J. Tversky, the famous psychiatrist, soll gesunden stark sein, writes in one of his books, very famous story that he said in many types in drushes. He was once in a dentist office and he had to wait. So he was bored to tears. So he picked up a magazine. And in the magazine there was an article entitled, How Do Lobsters Grow? Now, the last thing that Dr. Tversky really needs to know, or any from a yid, is who cares how lobsters grow? It's not that kind of anything to do with lobsters in my life. But it's better than sitting and staring at the wall. And the chacham that he is, he reads this article and he gets a life's lesson out of it. You know how lobsters grow. Lobsters are born little babies. And lobsters are born with a hard shell. That's their protection. So the little lobster begins to grow. And guess what? It gets very, very tight because he's outgrowing his shell. So what does the lobster do? I can't take this anymore. So he go, goes find a safe place at the seabed, maybe under a rock. He sheds his shell. And now he can go ahead and he can grow again because there's, he's not being constrained, confined by the shell. The little lobster grows a little more. Invite to dissolve a problem. He's outgrowing his shell. What does he do? He repeats the same thing until he becomes a mature and full grown lobster. What's the Musser Haskell? The Musser Haskell is because of the pressure because of the sense of confinement, because I feel constrained, that's why I have to go ahead and do something in order to be able to grow. And in this case, I have to get rid of the shell in order to be able to grow. And that's what the Swasemis is saying. We grow through Schwerkeiten. We grow through adversity. We grow because it's nicht green, weil es schwer. That's how we grow. You know, I learned in Baltimore 
Marysville my entire life. I've been there the overwhelming majority of, of my life, from the time I was 15 years old. In my time, we were Zeicha to have a mashkiach. His name was Reb David Kronklas, Zeicha Tzadik Levrocha. Can't see around the whole crowd. If there are any near Yisrael, I'll meet him. He's a near Yisrael Talmud. But Reb David was really a Tzadik. He was an Amis Tzadik. But he, was, he had the whole package. He was a Talmud Chocham. He was a Lamdan. He was a Paisek. He was a Balmusser. He was everything. And the, the Roshim that he left, and there he saw, especially the people of my generation that were Zeicha to, to have him, to hear the Meshmuzin, they're, they're, they're people who they are because of Rabdavid. Rabdavid learned in the Mir in Poland, and he went with the Mir to Vilna when, when they were escaping from Poland. And then he went across Siberia to they went to Kobe, Japan. And finally they went ahead. They went to Shanghai, where the Mir Yeshiva was for the entire period of the war. Reb David wrote a sefer called Divrei David. Divrei David is on Seder Zroim. It's not the really not a typical Yeshivish is safer. It's the lumdus and the understanding of the sugis of Seder Zroim, which is a very difficult Seder. There's no Gemara. So David writes in the Hagdama, I, I always felt it was a very, it's a very moving Hagdama. David writes there in the Hagdama that he doesn't say it in so many words, but he was he felt like it's a yuchka, it's a brochen. You know. He didn't know what was with his parents. The conditions in the mirror were, were so, so difficult. You know, when I read about the mirror yeshiva, I say to myself, I would have not survived. I, I don't think I would have survived. I mean, the conditions, the physical conditions. I mean, if I don't have air conditioning, forget it. Shanghai in the summer is hot and humid even worse than out there. But that's a garnish. People on Yom Kippur, when they were davening, there was no air conditioning. The Bakram were dropping like flies. So David writes over there, he says, I needed some kind of project. I need some kind of chizuk. I needed to go ahead and to stay focused because I saw that I was, he didn't say that he's maybe coming Ogeshvach. Because look what these Bokram were going through. They didn't know what's going to be with their parents. I found an article written in a book about Shanghai. Let me read to you a letter that a parent sent to his kids, his children who were learning in, in Shanghai. Dear children, you need no longer to write us. Stop warring. Stop running to consulates to beg for visas for us. There remains but one thing that you can do for us. Say Kaddish. Tear your garments to mark your grief, but heed the, heed the words of the Novi Yoyo. Tear your garments and not your clothes. Fill your minds with Tyra, your hearts with fear of Hashem, that wherever your destiny will take you, Tyra and Mitzvah will shield you from the frost of alien winds. Imagine getting a letter like that from your parents. This is the matzav that Rav David found himself in. So Rav David said, I, I was makabal on myself to learn through Seder's Royim and to go to the Sugis and to write down Chidush Taira. And that is the product, say, called Zivrei, Zivrei David, I'll say for Israel. This is an example of what the Gemara says, or the Medrash says, Omar of Choma Bar Papa, called Tyra Shomalati Ba'af Niskaimali. The Tyra that I learned Ba'af, that was schwer, that was difficult, 
That is what remains with me. I often wonder, had Rabdovid Kronkla Zecher Tzadik Livrocha, the war would not have broken out and Rabdovid would have remained in the mirror in Poland. I wonder if he would have written a Divrei Dovid. He wrote a Divrei Dovid because of Gven Schwer. That's what the Sasem is saying. And here's another example of this concept of no pain, no gain, growth through adversity. I hesitate to say over this story. This is verbatim. And if there's anybody here who's a Holocaust survivor, I ask, per, I ask forgiveness in the beginning because you're probably going to be appalled by what this woman says. And it's only she can say it because she was there. This is the story of Rebetz and Chaya Sora Kramer as recorded in the book, Holy Woman. She was deported to Auschwitz at the age of 20. Her entire family was sent to the gas chambers except for, two sis except for one sister who was shot before her eyes. She herself endured the worst tor tortures of the death camps, including Mengele's horrific medical experiments. Yet Rebetzin Kramer later said of her time there, Vize Lashoina. I was there with a group of religious girls like me, and together we tried to keep all the mitzvahs we could. We said brachas over food. We davened when the guards weren't watching and kept track of the days so when we, we would know when it was Shabbos. And we tried not to work. And here is the sentence. For me, Auschwitz was a good place. Now anyone who was in Auschwitz I don't know if they would be of the same opinion. But she was there. And she said this. And what she meant is that she grew through, because of the experience. I became who I am by persevering and meeting the challenges that I faced. Just like Yosef. Hashem mechartem heina. You know, there's a Sefer on Chumash called Darke Musar, written by Rabbi Yaakov Naiman. He makes a Ha'ora on a famous Rashi. Ayeshev Yaakov, Vever Shova of Ayeshev Yaakov, Zokta Po Zokta Rashi, Bikesh Yaakov. Leishev b'shalva. Yaakov wanted, no, I want I want an easy life for the rest of my life. Kofatz alav roigzel shal Yosef. If you say to our parashis, you know, you have vaye, he have the, you have the broches and told us he has to steal the broches, vaye, he has to run away, vaye, shlacht against the mice with love on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, kumtze vaye, shev. Vayeshev Yaakov, Bikish Yaakov, Leishev Mishalva, Kofatzel of Regal Shal Yosef. The rest was child's play, maybe. Because then they had the mice with Yosef. Zokt Rashi, Tzadikim Mivakshin Leishev Mishalva. Tzadikim want to have it serene. Aymer HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Lai Dain Le Tzadikim Hashem, Musukun Lem Lo Elam Abba, Siz Nish Genug, it's not enough. So Rebbe says to Yaakov, no, you ain't finished yet. Here's Yasef. Seems that Rebbe Shalom has tainus on Yaakov Avinu. Is Leishi B'Shalva? It's so wrong to be Leishi B'Shalva? What do you think Yaakov Avinu wanted Leishe B'Shalva for? You think he wanted to go down to the biblical equivalent of Miami Beach and sit there on the beach on a rocking, in a rocking chair and go to kosher restaurants? That's B.K. Yaakov Leishe B'Shalva? 
Yaakov Inu wanted to be Bishalvo because he wanted to shtarig and he wanted to grow and he wanted to have to the Menuchas on Nefesh. So what's wrong? What's wrong with Shalva? The answer is, Rebbe Shalom said to Yaakov Avinu, I put you on this world to achieve ultimate perfection. Yaakov's mission in this world would only happen through the trials and tribulations that Yaakov Avinu endured. As opposed to the other Avais, Yaakov had it mamish the toughest, faced difficulties all of his life. He incurred the wrath of his brother Esau. He had to flee for his life. He spent more than 20 years having to deal with the ultimate used car salesman, Lovon. And then the scary encounter after those years with Esau, when he was feared for his life and the life of his family. And then the subsequent Misa with Dina and Shimon and Levi. And then the entire story of Yosef and his brothers. It was a life of one Tzorah after another Tzorah. But as a result of that, Yaakov Avinu becomes Bechir Shabbos. That's a statement, Bechir Shabbos. By virtue of all those challenges. The Yibbun Islam is not punishing him for Bikei Shachalei Shebeshalva. He's merely saying to him, your work in this world is not done yet. And your destiny is to grow through tests and challenges. Yodel the Nitziv, from Avtolit Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, in his parish in Chumish, writes an amazing thing. We all know Rabbi Isai, there are two Talmudim, Talmudim, Shnei Talmudim, Pavli and Yushalmi. Zokhtan Itziv, if we had to guess which Talmud is more halig than the other, Talmud Yushalmi should be more halig than Talmud Pavli. Talmud Yushalmi was written in the environments of Eretz Yisrael with the Kedusha Sa'oretz of Eretz Yisrael, with the Avira of Eretz Yisrael Machim, and all the other milas of, of, of Eretz Yisrael. Talmud Bavli is written in a Tumadika land. B'machashakim Hoshivani. It's a land of Choshech, not a land of Or. So which should be the desired Talmud, if one can say that? Zok der Heilig in Itziv, Valoz and Rashiva. The Talmud Bavli is the Talmud that we learn. It's the Talmud that we harv on. It's the, 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 the Talmud which we do Daf Yaimi on. It's the Talmud which we teach in yeshivas. It's the Talmud which every little kid in fifth grade learns Eilu Metzias. Talmud Bavli. Why? Fakert. Because it was writ written, written in a Tomidical land, in a land of Cheshech, the product is even more choshev. You have to be a nitziv who knew kol kula to say that. All this points to the same conclusion. We all would rather have serene and calm lives. But sometimes that is not our lot in life, nor is it our mission in life. And I want to tell you something, and this is so important for anyone who's still raising children or grandchildren. Sometimes it's not the lot of our life, the children, our lives, children, to have it easy either. You know, there was an expression that went around several years ago, they still use it. It's called being a helicopter parent. Now what's a helicopter parent? It's a helicopter parent, it refers to a parent or to parents 
who hover over their children and make sure that they are safe at all times and under their constant supervision. You have to watch them always. This means no unsupervised play. That means no walking or biking to school. No trips to the park without a parent there. Because I have to watch, nothing goes wrong. Nothing will happen. Helicopter parent, they hover over their kids. So recently I saw Anaya Madrega. A Madrega was even grasser than the helicopter parent. That's called the snow plow parent. <laughs> What's the snow plow parent? The snow plow parent is the parent that makes sure that nothing should ever stand in the way of a child's success. And like a snow plow, they will remove any obstacle in that way. While we all love our children and we want them to succeed, but sometimes it's important for our children to have to face adversity and even to fail and to learn to get up again. And trying to shield them from every single challenge in life is not doing them a teva. It's doing them a, a raw. It starts with things like asking the teacher to give them a good part in the play. Or to make sure that they get an award at the end of the year. You know, there's a concept in the Velt that we're probably shielded from because our kids don't play in leagues and stuff like that. But you know what a participation trophy is? It used to be, you know, you'd have the leagues, you go ahead, you get to the playoffs, you win the playoffs, you win the trophy. No. Today, everybody has to win a trophy. It's called a participation trophy. You get a trophy because you participated. I, you struck out every time you went at bat? No, mark the dice. You participated. Fadem comes to a trophy. That's a snowplow parent. Because you can't lose. Because you're going to lose, it's going to hurt your ego, it's going to hurt your self image. Guess what? Sometimes it's good to lose. Sometimes you have to lose. You know, I'm sure you're aware of the scandal that happened a couple months ago about parents trying to get their kids into top colleges, you know, prestigious colleges. And you know what happened. They bribed pro proctors, they bribed coaches, a be to get their kid into the right program. And perhaps the most egregious example of that is the parent that got their ch child by bribing the coach a scholarship on the water polo team, even though the kid couldn't swim. What, what, what I don't, I can't fail to understand, there is one couple from China that paid five million dollars to get their kid into a program. Give the kid the five million dollars and tell him, go ahead and invest with my mom, man. What degree could be worth five million dollars? Snowplow parents. Nothing could be difficult. Nothing could be schwer. You want to hear a worse example? I read about a ki kid who went off to college. But since the time he was a young boy, you could not eat anything with sauce on it. When he would go to a friend's house to play, the mother would call up the other mother and say, whatever you do, when you serve him, whatever is spaghetti or whatever, no sauce. Don't like sauce. Call Yomov. Call Yomov. Like Tom, Tom, sauce, me Yomov. 
Kupterein in college, goes in the cafeteria. What is it? They put sauce. I'm not making this up. He left the school. Because <laughs> he couldn't handle the sauce. Because his mother made sure that he never had to have sauce. I gave this to Russia once before. And a fellow came up to me after the drusha, told me the following. 17 years ago, I had a Down syndrome child. And if someone would have come to me and said, I'll take away the child if you give me your house, he would have given it to him on the spot. And now he says, 17 years later, that child is the pride of his life. And he wouldn't give that child away for anything. It's difficult raising a child like that, not to be minimized. But he saw he grew because of it. And he saw the nachas throughout the challenges. And again, Rabbi Isai, I'm like the rest of you, or most of you. I like serenity. I like it easy. Also, Baruch Hashem. But if we have challenges, and everybody has their challenges, then this is an opportunity for growth. No pain, no gain. You know what the mucker of that expression is? It's from exercising, which means if you want to lose weight, you can't walk slowly to shul, you know, and uh, you, know. you got to schwitz. You're on the treadmill, you have to keep on upping the ante because no pain, no gain. And that's the way it is in Ruchnius also. I just want to close with a, a letter that I recently read in one of the Jewish magazines. This again is a verbatim quote. I was diagnosed with advanced pancreatic cancer in November 2017. This article was written in February 2019. Meaning the woman is still alive. Kanai Nahara. Halavai Vaiter. Pancreatic cancer is a very terrible cancer. Very terrible. I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in November 2017 at the age of 35. At that time, my newborn twins were four months old and my two older children were under the age of five. My world was turned upside down and I was thrown in the battle of my life. Baruch Hashem, I am doing amazingly well. And I've so far defied the statistics and the doctor's diagnoses. My husband and I have faced this yainus that no other person should ever have to face. But through this, our ideals, our thinking, and our vision have changed. And she's happy for those changes. And as amazing as this may seem, I have heard this 
from other cancer survivors as well. They went to Gehenna and back. But if they're able to survive, they become different people. Rabbarach Sarot Sanzei Tzadik Levrocha tells her Rashiva was diagnosed with cancer. And when he was first given the diagnosis, he said, I would have raised a million dollars to be able to get rid of it and not have to face it. But after he survived, he ultimately died from it. But for a while he was alive. He says, I wouldn't have given it away for a million dollars. It's the same thing. If we are able to go ahead and to, to survive the challenges and grow from it, we become different people, better people. Grace and mention. That's what Rebetzin Chaya Kramer said from experience in Auschwitz. That's what this woman says from experience with pancreatic cancer. It's hard to imagine. Should save us from such shverness, yainis, rachmat al-Islan, as terrible illnesses like that. But when we face things that are schwer, and yes, why, why do I need this? I don't need this. Who needs this? Think to ourselves about the lobster. Think to ourselves about Reb David, Lahavdil. Think about Rebetzin. Chai Craner, speak, think about this woman. Banish Shalom should, if he gives us Nesyanus challenges, he should give us the Kaychas to be able not only to survive, but to thrive as well. A good Tanach and a good Zummer. Shame, Irgenshire, Tyra, Moses, Boston. I'd like to give a big yeshe kerch to our friend for the very inspiring drosh. I'd like to give a big yeshe kerch to Rally Goldbaum for sponsoring tonight's shir. I'd like to give a big yeshe kerch to Edom Shame for sponsoring tonight's shir as a schus for Tushu Duchem Bekarov. I'd like to give a big yeshe kerch for the sponsor tonight's shir with Edom Shame, Lili Nishama, Yisrael of Chaim Yitzchak, Ben Arav Israel, Mashalam Asnomi, Basar of Gedalia Ari, and Raschava Basar of Aron Yisrael, and Mashalim. Boisei Egan Shir Terry lies on the Seber support and sponsoring the shiurim to help continue bringing these shiurim to the community. Call Egan Shir Terra 718-851-8651 or email tape center at yeshivanet.com to have the scrapes close to sponsoring Yeshir and Abbas's Terra Durabim. CDs of tonight's show will be available shortly. Kananya Ben Akashim, Ratzak Adish Boruch, Lezakis, Yisrael, Afrika, Hibbalim, Tarim, Mitzvah, Shanem, Adonai, Chofes, Aman, Sidke, Yagul, Terra, Vyadeh.